A new parliament, a new government, a new prime minister, and a new minister of finance, Mr. Speaker, Bill Morneau. Today, we begin to restore hope for the middle class. Today, we begin to revitalize the economy. Bill Morneau, delivering his budget speech on March the 22nd, introducing the Trudeau government's first budget, growing the middle class. A budget is probably the biggest day in the parliamentary calendar. Unlike the more vague and high-level language of, say, the speech from the throne, which outlines the government's agenda, the budget is where the rubber meets the road. What money actually gets spent and what actually happens or not. For everyone in Ottawa, both those inside the government and those outside, like me, who make their living commenting on, following, watching, and observing what goes on in the federal government, a budget day is like Christmas Day, full of anticipation, full of surprises, some pleasant and some not so pleasant. There are different ways to look at a budget. The first is the immediate impact on individuals and families. Will it mean more or less cash in their pockets? Much of the media coverage focuses on the impact on individuals and families. In fact, the budget document itself adopts this same approach, introducing us to a fictionalized couple called David and Nira. A second way to look at the budget are the specific projects the government says it's going to fund. For instance, building a bridge or helping pay for a mass transit line. These are big deals for the communities affected. A budget always contains lots of spending announcements, especially a budget like this one, the first one of a new government just after the election. The 270 pages in this budget document are sprinkled with spending announcements that range from reinstating the Coast Guard Rescue Station in Kitsilano, Vancouver, to rebuilding the Marine Ferry Dock in North Sydney, Nova Scotia, the terminus for the ferry to Newfoundland. A third focus when looking at a budget is the government's fiscal plan. Fiscal plan is jargon for the outlook or the forecast for spending and revenues and the resulting deficit. There's always a lot of commentary about whether the fiscal plan is believable, sustainable, responsible. And it's here we get into the debate about is the debt going up and whether this is a responsible thing to do, leaving a debt for our grandchildren. And a fourth way to look at the federal budget is its impact on the overall Canadian economy. How much economic activity will it stimulate and how many jobs will result? There's both a short-term and a long-term aspect to this. For instance, say the government plans to build a new bridge. Immediately, there's hiring workers and purchasing material to build the bridge. This is the short-term stimulus. In the longer term, once the bridge is built, there's a question of how it enables increased economic activity. Does it make it easier for manufacturers to move their goods to market? Or does it make it easier for people to commute from one side of the bridge to the other? This is the long-term impact. Where we run into some issues is figuring out what things are legitimate investments. For instance, the Trudeau government's first budget talks a lot about investment. In fact, it's probably one of the most used words in this document. And the question for economists is, what spending really are legitimate investments? So let's look at the Trudeau government's first budget in more detail. First, the changes that impact individuals and families. The big winners, as the media likes to call them, the big winners in this budget are families with children, middle class and upper middle class taxpayers, employment insurance recipients, and low income single seniors. There are also significant increases to veterans benefits and to spending on Indigenous Canadians, although I hesitate to call these groups winners, considering the terrible situation many of them are in, and the fact that this new spending will probably just make a start towards fixing that. The single biggest new program in this budget is spending on families with children. The new Canada Child Benefit rolls up three existing tax and benefit programs and sweetens the pot with another $4.5 billion in 2016. 
That's almost 40% of new spending in the budget. The budget plan says the average increase in benefits for families will be almost $2,300, or about $190 per month. That's the average. All told, according to the budget, about 90% of Canadian families are going to receive more in child benefits under this new system. Here's a chart for families with one child, and here's another chart for families with two children. Now in this second chart, when you look closely at it, the benefit gain appears to be greatest for families earning around $45,000 a year in family income. A family at that income level with two kids will get well over $4,000 more per year than under the current system. Money I'm sure they'll appreciate, especially since the benefit is paid monthly and it's non-taxable. Now let's compare that to the gain for families earning $30,000 and less in family income. Their net increase will be just under $2,000 per year. That's about half the increase of a family earning $45,000 per year. In fact, it seems that the family earning $30,000 a year and less will have a net gain that's exactly equal to a family earning $120,000 per year. Now, I suppose the obvious question we might ask is whether or not that's fair. So that's the new Canada Child Benefit. No question, it's a major innovation, a significant increase in spending, $4.5 billion in the first year alone. But there are some questions that could be asked about how fair it is. And the question of fairness can also be asked about the next item, the middle class tax cut, the so-called middle class tax cut. Here the budget doesn't show the impact on different income levels, which makes you ask why. The only chart shows the reduction in the tax applied to taxable income between $45,000 and $90,000. And that's what the Liberals promised during the last election campaign. According to the budget, some 9 million Canadians are going to benefit to some degree from this tax cut. A single tax filer will get an average tax reduction of $330 a year, and a couple will get an average tax reduction of $540 per year. For a single person, that works out to be a gain of about $28 a month. And for a couple, the gain is about $45 a month. Now bear in mind, those are averages. If you earn, say, $50,000 a year, the tax cut will only apply to income above $45,000. And at a $50,000 income level, you'll only get the tax cut on $5,000 of your income. Compare that to the person who earns $90,000 annually. They get the tax cut on half their income, all the income above the $45,000 lower threshold. And there's the rub. The person earning the higher income actually gets the biggest tax cut. When McLean's magazine reported on this story back in December, David McDonald, an economist at the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, used actual tax data from Statistics Canada to calculate that families who will get the most from this tax cut are families earning between $166,000 and $210,000 per year. This new Liberal government seems to have anticipated there could be some criticism about this, and they aren't arguing it's fair. No, no, they're saying it's all about investment. It seems to be a Canadian version of trickle-down economics. Instead of cutting taxes on the wealthy, in Canada, we cut taxes on the middle class, and then the middle class is supposed to take that money, save it, and then invest it, and that's going to create jobs. Here's a tweet from the Prime Minister's office that says just that. The Liberals probably focus-tested investment and found that it's a word that rings a lot of bells with Canadians. Investment sounds like something responsible, far-sighted, worth doing. Who can argue? The cost of this middle class tax cut is $1.3 billion in the coming fiscal year. But since the Liberals are cancelling the income splitting for families with children, that was introduced by the Harper Conservative government last year, the net effect is that there will actually be an increase in tax revenue overall. The next major increase for payments to individuals in the budget are increases in employment insurance payouts. That amounts to over a billion dollars in the coming fiscal year. There's also an increase in the income supplement for low-income single seniors, which will cost about half a billion dollars this year 
and $670 million next year when it's fully implemented. And there's a big increase in veterans' benefits. That amounts to about $400 million a year. In fact, they front-end loaded some of this by adding almost $4 billion in charges to the fiscal year just ending. This almost $4 billion charge is one way of making sure the 2015 fiscal year ends with a deficit. And you can see the budget also adds in almost $50 million to support cancer research. Looks like there could be some politics here. Ask yourself, are the conservative opposition likely to complain about veterans' benefits and cancer research as the reason why the last year they were in government ends with a deficit? Finally, let's take a look at increased funding for Indigenous Canadians. Here we move away from payments to individuals to support for a group. No question about it, spending on Indigenous Canadians is going up by a lot. $1.5 billion in this fiscal year alone. A third of that goes for housing and another third for education. That increases to $2 billion next year with a big increase again in both housing and education. Indigenous spending is also one of the few tables in this budget that shows a five-year spending horizon. It seems odd that they show a five-year spending horizon here, where most of the budget's programs only show the immediate two years. What is clear, according to most commentators who have expertise in this area, is that $1.2 billion in social infrastructure over five years is really just a start to meet the staggering needs that Indigenous communities and Northern communities face. And this doesn't even touch the needs facing Canada's urban Indigenous population. Now I've just mentioned social infrastructure. That's another magic word in this budget, infrastructure. In our next look at the budget, we'll look at how much of that infrastructure spending can legitimately be called investment. I'm Andrew Hall. Thank you.